Hi, everyone. Welcome to this evening's virtual event with Lulu Miller. We are so excited to be here with everyone tonight. Um, my name is Carell Centers, and I'm the events director here at Bookshop Santa Cruz, or I'm broadcasting live from my desk. And I first want to quickly thank our co-sponsor, the Humanities Institute at UC Santa Cruz, for being our fabulous partner on so many events, including this one, um, and really helped get the word out about tonight's event. We have so many fantastic people joining us tonight, um, 175 of you out there. So thank you so much for being here for this special event. Um, and yeah, here at Bookshop, we know there's a lot going on in the world right now. And as an independent bookstore, our community is vital to us locally, nationally, and even globally. And we're so grateful to you for spending your resources and your evening with us in the midst of this global pandemic, rapid climate deterioration, the essential work of dismantling the lie of white supremacy, and ongoing economic and political upheaval. We see these talks as a way to deepen and refresh in order to return to the vital work that is before us. And we hope you find both refuge and inspiration here. So tonight we're thrilled to welcome Lulu to celebrate the paperback release of Why Fish Don't Exist, which has been a massive hit on staff here at Bookshop Santa Cruz, as well as among our customers. And anyone who's read it will understand the incredible praise that it's gotten. Um, it is just such a fabulous book. I was reading it all weekend and um, it's everything they say is true. So if you are joining us and you haven't yet read the book, um, there might be spoilers ahead because we do want to dig into some of the rich topics that are here. Just a spoiler warning. So Lulu and I will discuss why fish don't exist and then she will answer some of your questions. Um, and some of you have already found the ask a question tab at the bottom of your screen. A couple of other orientation housekeeping details for you to know is that but we can't see you. Um, we can just see that you're here in the event live with us. Um, to the right side of your screen is the chat field, which is where you can pop in greetings, share where you're coming from. Um, if you find it distracting, you can hide that by clicking on the little, little arrow at the top right. I can just carry on without you. Again, the ask a question button is at the bottom of the screen. Uh, ask a question. I see three already there. So thrilled to get to your questions a little bit later in the evening. We also have a donate button if you'd like to donate to tonight's event. I want to thank everyone that has donated so generously to our events program tonight and every night that we have events. Um, we really appreciate every dollar that comes in and you guys are helping us make these events accessible and keeping our events program going strong, strong. So thank you so much. If you haven't yet purchased the book, you can do so by clicking buy the book at the bottom of the screen there. Your purchase of the featured book tonight is what powers our events and it shows the publisher that our audience is invested and engaged supports the author for their work and their time and positions your local indie bookstore to support face-to-face -face programming like tonight. So thank you so much for your purchase of the book. We do have a couple other uh, events coming up that I want to mention that also have why in the title. On Wednesday, we have Daniel Lieberman for Exercised, Why Something We Never Evolved to Do is Healthy and Rewarding. And then next Wednesday, April 21st, we have Bonnie Sui for Why We Swim. So it's an, a month of whys, and we hope you come back for more. But now on to the main attraction. Lulu Miller is the co-founder of the NPR program Invisibilia, a series about the unseen forces that control human behavior. Before creating Invisibilia, she produced Radio Lab for five years and was a reporter on the NPR Science Desk. Lulu received an MFA from the University of Virginia on a Poe Faulkner Fellowship, and she's currently the co-host of NPR's Radio Lab. And I know that I'm not alone when I say that's one of my favorite podcasts. So um, just so thrilled to welcome her to the screen tonight. Please join me in welcoming Lulu Miller. Hi. <laughs> to be here someday, I hope here is there for real. Yes. Um, and we're gonna welcome you. All, to yes. Thank you all for still joining the virtual events. Going strong. <laughs> Yes, they are. Some more than others. So thank you so much. Um, it's been such a draw and um, we're so thrilled to have you here virtually in your beautiful scaled jacket. It's a full pantsuit. Oh my god. I just think that people need yes. to know. Oh I'm borrowing god. it from a former real estate agent, a man. It's a long story, but this is how we're celebrating in oh isolated gosh. times. If you when you come to Santa Cruz in the flesh, you're mm -hmm. please wear the pantsuit. And we're gonna get you to the beach to take some surf lessons. It's gonna be great. Um, I'm it. really excited about this. <laughs> 
So, um, wow, that's, this event just even got so much better. Um, so we have, there's so much we can talk about. I mean, I'm so interested in so many things about your career and Radio Lab and, and the Science Desk, everything, but we really want to talk about the book because it is just so amazing. Um, the writing is fresh and entertaining and original and sharp and um it made me feel smart when I was reading it, which is it doesn't mean that it it means the book like was like the right <laughs> level and so many levels, you know. Um, and it's funny; it made me laugh. Um, so thank you so much for the gifts that you gave to the world with this book. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, was it? Um, so was it? I mean, you you studied writing. You did go. You know, you got your MFA in writing and stuff. Was it different to to write a book um, versus kind of radio reporting? What was that like? Oh my God, so huge, so, so different. I mean, oh, I've, ever since I was little, I've always wanted to write. I, I, when I was little, I would write, you know, fiction stories about talking animals and stuff. And that was kind of always the dream. And, and then I had this like amazing accidental detour into the world of radio podcasting before it became like a thing. Um, and I got to learn this, this world of audio journalism. And the thing I, love about radio and why it will always have my hooks in me is that, you know, for an hour or two, you go out into the world, you get interview tape and you're like on, oh, you're super on and just, you mess up or it's great or whatever. And then, and then it's like an introvert's paradise. And then you go back to your cave and you have like these two hours and you edit them and you arrange the best moments. And it's like, it feels like a puzzle um, in a certain way, it, radio making to me, where, where you just, you have these pieces and then you write little bridges to connect them. Or maybe you add some music, or maybe you get one more interview, right? But it's contained. And like, for me writing a book, obviously I did reporting, I did interviews out of habit, I recorded everything, but it was like, there was just so much more unknown because you weren't limited by tape to make a good story. Like on the air, you get some tape, you get someone being funny, you get someone being emotional, you wanna use that tape. But then on the page, it's like you get this fourth dimension where you could just, there's no time limits. Like you don't have to use tape. In fact, just a, a really good writer could use descriptions to accomplish the same things, the right way of describing a scene or an interaction. And so to me, it added this fourth dimension of on one hand, utterly expansive, there's that thrill of not having those constraints. Um, but it was so much more daunting. And for me, a lot of the journey felt like it was writing it and learning everything and researching and reporting laced with this existential question of like, will the journey of me writing the book be that I discover I can't write a book? Like, I don't know how to do this. And wow. it was lonelier. I think it was lonelier. There wasn't a team. There was an amazing editor, bless his soul. But it Love was lonelier. Thank yeah. you, editors. Yeah. 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 Well, hopefully your conclusion at the end of it was that you can write a book and that maybe you want to write another book. Um, but I imagine too, like going through that process where there's that less limitations with something that you were so obsessed with, I guess is, a, is fair to say, or like this journey that you had already kind of been on. I mean, it must've been hard to kind of pull all the pieces together um, given that it was such a broad, you know, uh, exploration, I guess. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And there, there's so much in it. I mean, there's the science, which there's the taxonomy and, and then there's the history and there's, then we get into eugenics, which was, you know, such an interesting turn for the book. Um, and, and then towards the end, we learn why fish don't exist. So there's, there's just, it's such a wonderful journey to go on it with you. Um, so we, you know, we kind of start with, with David and his journey and, you know, it's interesting you refer to him by the first okay, name. I'll show a book. picture as you talk. You keep going. Yeah, okay. I'll show a picture. Because the book yes, has the illustrations are a delight as well. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah we, you start, going. we start with David. Oh, we start with David and we get the history of his life, you know, Puritan and kind of this this entrancement with him or kind of, you know, seeking um, to you the resonation with him, especially as it goes with your dad. Um, and, you know, that process, it really took a while. Was it hard to kind of not give give away, you know, to kind of pace it, like you're framing it, you know, without canceling him at the beginning, like you're giving him his due. And then later comes the kind of reveal about he's actually, it's kind of unacceptable in a way, you know what I mean? So oh, how yeah. is that to kind of lay it out like that? Well, I will say, I mean, my, my first draft, I did way heavier foreshadowing. Like I was, I, I, 
there was, I hinted at the darkness a lot more, both in the prologue and in a few of the earlier chapters. Um, and again, my, my first editor, I had two editors on the book who were both insanely amazing as they switched jobs. But my first editor, John Cox was like, no, this has to be a question. Like you have to like take the reader on more of a journey and, and, and really like exist in the moment of you being charmed by him and don't like show, I showed a lot of leg. I mean, I still wanted it to be a journey. Um, and I think that that was like a really brilliant piece of advice. I mean, I, I was still trying to be subtle. I didn't want to give everything away. Yeah. Um, but he was like, yeah, just, I think almost in this old fashioned serialistic way, like give the reader a good yarn and let them go on the journey. And, um, you know, for myself as a researcher, I went on a journey. Like I, I did see early on, he was involved in the eugenics movement. But as someone who worked on a history podcast told me, it was like anyone in 19th or early 20th century science and politics kind of dabbled. And so I didn't, I truly didn't know the extent of it until like years in when I finally got my hand, hands on his original text and started to see like, oh, he's not just saying a few other scientists think this is a good guy. He's like bringing it over and trying to sell people on it and like shaking money out of rich people mm. to seed institutes in favor of eugenics. So yeah. There was a journey for myself, um, but then there was totally some craft and some storytelling, like in the name of take, giving someone a like hopefully a better reading experience by holding back. So that was definitely like the genius of my editor to really pull that back. Nice. That's yeah. really interesting. Yeah, yeah. And like kind of the layers, like it's like unpeeling the layers. And I mean, even to get kind of metaphorical about it, like when you find a fish and you, you know, you talk about, again, with that beautiful elastic language that you have, um, you, you know, talk about cutting it open. What do you see inside? And then there's this, and then, you know, a generation later, a different scientist are going to find something else and classify it this way. And it kind of has to do with how we apply it to history and to human, you know, to viewpoints as well. Um, even though, even at the time, like, obviously it's unacceptable anytime to be with to be having those views. Um, and then politically even to like explore, like, no, this wasn't another country. This was us, this was here. And it kind of made me think about, you know, with all the recent, all the crazy bullshit that's happening and the hatred that's happening. And the people say, this is, this is not America. And it's like, is it though? You know what I mean? And then this is more evidence of like, we have these, these parts of ourselves in this country that kind of not to get too dark, but that, that they, that they grow here. And it's something about that that's very disturbing, you know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I mean, that was like, I feel a belated learning experience for me. I feel ashamed, like for not realizing the extent to which, you know, in certain ways we were ahead of the Nazis on certain ideas where they actually had posters that said, we don't stand alone. We passed our mandatory sterilization laws of people who we deemed unfit. And we wanted to essentially like slow roll out of the population for the good of public welfare. We passed that like 10 to 15 years before the Nazis started doing that. And they, they had posters that said, we don't stand alone with an American flag. And there were American eugenicists who then saw that, that you know, the Nazis were making headway, who in the early days said the Nazis are beating us at our own game. So there's, I mean, that's the tip of the iceberg. There is so much. People have written beautiful books on this mm -hmm. connection to really looking at that. But um, yeah, I mean, the thing I think about it and, you know, so why didn't I know that's partly my own ignorance and failure to go. But there's also like thinking about curriculum and mm -hmm. it feels like such a like dry wonky topic in a certain way. Mm -hmm. But what if we did have to learn that? What mm -hmm. if like all US students had to learn that? And it wouldn't have to necessarily be, you know, I think it just would empower people to think that, you know, to look, to study really closely. What were the ideas that convinced so many intelligent seeming people and even, you know, people with, what they thought were good intentions, the road to help, but you know, um, like how did this brainwash our entire country? The first five presidents approved of it, you know, and like to miss as a student um, growing up in the eighties and nineties, like to completely miss that, it does feel like there of myself and that's mm -hmm. there for sure. But it also, I blame, I blame the education system a little. And there's this one man who I, I talk about really briefly in the book, um, Mark Bold, but he is his whole awesome own person. He's a lawyer in Virginia who does kind of standard family law. 
but pro bono on his free time, he does all this work kind of trying to get reparations for people who are sterilized um, due to eugenic flaws. And there's still a lot of them alive, which mm -hmm. you know stunned me. Um, but his other passion project is like getting it on the curriculum. And he mm -hmm. actually succeeded in Virginia. And I think it's either wow. eighth or ninth grade does have to teach this. And I do hope more states will go that way because so much of our national identity is about we fought the Nazis. We fought against eugenics. Like we decide, we define ourselves in opposition to that as a point of pride. Um, but I think it would be a more you'd make a more interesting citizen if you look at the ways in which we actually bought into the ideas and um, have to have the kids. right. And it's still. I mean, you point out in the book, it's still on the books. Like it's it's still federal. Yeah. It's still legally allowed at a federal level. Yeah. To. to and, uh, you know, sterilized. sterilized. Yeah, which is yeah. And I'll just do the one disclaimer for the the legal scholars out there. So yeah, so like the the Buck v. Bell, the 1927 Supreme Court case, which allowed for the mandatory sterilization of people deemed unfit in the name of public welfare. With that famous line, three imbeciles, three generations of imbeciles is more than enough. It has never been overturned. When I first started out, um, oh, are, is anyone else frozen? Frozen? Yes, no. Are we frozen? <laughs> Okay. Let me type a note in here if you um, refresh your screen. Or did I just did I just bore you with <laughs> not going on too long? I'll speed up my answers. But this I think is important because when I first started to my ears are turning red because I'm passionate. Um when I first started to research this, a lot of people um were were you know, some people said, well, it has never been overturned, but like it's in this place of legal purgatory where you couldn't act on it because every state has overturned or repealed their laws. But the more and more I dug into it and talked to lawyers who work on this and disability activists, um, it turns out they're basically half of the states still allow for it in new language. They don't use the word unfit, but they use the word mentally deficient or unable to give informed consent. So there's new words, but there's still an idea that there are some people who don't get to decide for themselves and they're not being sterilized for their own health, which is its own muddy question but for the good of others. So that is still sterilized, that's still eugenic thinking. And it's weedy and complicated, but there it, it still goes on illegally and legally. And that's the really chilling thing. Yeah, yeah, it, it really is. And it's it's so, you know, it's so troubling, I guess, that they don't see as, you know, as you write, it's like right there. It's kind of hidden, but it, it's right there. And Darwin talks about it in he, speaking of good writers, like he's amazing as well. Um, but yeah, he talks about variation, like hello. And so like reading the origin of species, like you see that word over and over. And it's like, well, I guess you just, you, you know, these people that are proponents of eugenics and things like that, they're going to see what they want to see. They already have that agenda, I suppose. Right. How can you miss it? You know, the gene diversity. And then like for me, it was just like that word diversity like, hello, it's good everywhere for everything, you know? Yeah. So yeah, um, hopefully we continue to, you know, to kind of continue to change. And that was another thing that I, moving away from the topic of eugenics, which is very important. And also the, by the way, the women that you talked to in the book, um, uh, Anna and Mary were, that was a really, really tender um, moment and a series of moments in the books as well, in the book as well that I really enjoyed. Um, but also, yeah, with the, um, with the kind of like scientific process and everything like that, I wanted to kind of ask about that. So they go and they they get the fish and they decide, you know, or the fish, you know, um, and then they, <laughs> and they they decide this is a new fish, never been seen before. We're going to name it. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how that like? A, how do they know it's the first time ever that that fish has been discovered? Or is it just, you know, I mean, in the kind of formal academy of sciences, that's how it counts to be the first one. And like, how do they choose the names and things like that? I mean, I think if there's a, I mean, that is such an interesting question because I think that in and of itself seemingly technical question mm -hmm. is also riddled with the kinds of dangerous hierarchies. and. Most fish that scientists are naming and get credit for were absolutely discovered and named by often indigenous people or people from the cultures where they're going and planting flags of the flag of knowledge. You know, it's it is it's like a certain it's a form of co colonialism to like say, you know, um, so there's a whole history there of the people who actually knew the fish being left out. But to claim, you know, to claim the. Um, credit in this official scientific ledger, um, you know, it's like a series, 
of processes, which is always evolving and getting more and more complicated, where you submit it, as I understand, you submit it for review. It's kind of like peer review at this point where, and there's interesting questions of, is this really new? And how do we decide something's not just a variation or a new species? And in the world of taxonomy, um, there's kind of a, a divide of people. You can either be a splitter or a lumper. And lumpers lump things so much together that some other people think are different species. They're all like, nah, that's all a tadpoleus Latinus. And then the splitters are like, they see every little difference as proof of a new species. And this is, again, it's like, at the end of the day, even at the level of species, this is a human line that we're drawing over this free flowing thing of nature. And these lines we draw where we where we call difference in species or order or class, they're useful. And I'm not saying they're they're totally like inaccurate necessarily, but a lot of the time they're guesswork. A lot of the time they're proxy. Um, they're not divine word. Um, in that way, I think it's actually different than math, where you're where you're kind of like discovering a thing that's out there. I think some of the work of taxonomy and naming nature is at the end of the day, it's, it's approximations. Um, and a lot of the categories that we think of as sacred are kind of gerrymandered. But anyway, blah, blah, blah. Given all that, there are sort of like, much like getting a peer reviewed study um, mm -hmm. published, there's kind of a team where, you, where people submit. Um, I was actually, when I was interviewing at the, um, the Smithsonian has an, an annex building out in Maryland where they keep like all their holotypes, their original creatures and this massive specimen collection of like all different kinds of animals. Mm. And while I was there, this guy discovered a new fish. And like, he, it was this little eel that was around the Christmas islands that there was some debate on, was it different than another eel? And he was pretty sure, and he came in running and he was like, 13 vertebrae, 13 vertebrae. And that meant it probably was a new species because the other one only had 12. And so, and he was like, and I asked, I was like, what are you going to name it? And he's like, well, I don't know yet, but I was thinking of getting clever and calling it blah, 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 eel, Clausius after Santa Claus, like his little <laughs> wing toward Christmas island. So people famously name it after friends. They name ugly species after enemies. I mean, it's a whole, like, it's a whole, it's a whole human endeavor full mm -hmm. of both bureaucracy and passion. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. It's so interesting. Like there's, there's a part towards the beginning of the book, you know, more in the middle or somewhere, somewhere in the book and this wonderful ride um, where you, you kind of talk about how naming brings things, the importance of naming things and um, how that can kind of make them real or, or again, order the chaos and things like that. Um, and then later on, when we actually discover kind of like why fish don't exist, I think it's um, Anna or Mary, one of the women that survives the, um, the eugenics institution that they were placed into. I'm probably saying that wrong, but she points out, you know, naming something keeps you from seeing it. And I just thought, wow, that's so interesting. Like rather than bringing it forth into so that we see it more clearly, it by categorizing, we become complacent or we become lazy kind of. It's really, I just found that to be so interesting. Oh my God, thank you for mentioning that line. I mean, this is a woman, this was Anna. And she was mm -hmm. sterilized against her will, against repeated, attempts not to be sterilized um, because she really wanted to have kids. She was great with kids, so great with kids. She was asked to work in the nursery school in the institution. Um, and uh, shortly after her 18th birthday, she was told she was given a checkup. She was um, given some kind of you know, sleeping gas and fell asleep, anesthesia, and then she woke up with a scar and this had been done to her. And it's like a lifelong injury. It's not just the moment, obviously. And the grounds on which she was sterilized was that she, you know, scored low on intelligence tests, which are inherently like made up by humans and one measure of intelligence. And this idea that she was mentally unfit and couldn't take care of a kid. And um, yeah, this kind of knock on her intelligence essentially. And she said what, I mean, easily one of the most deep, profound things I've ever heard a person say. I, I interview experts for a living. And it was, it was, she worried that once you name a thing, you stop looking at it. And this idea that like, okay, once, it, once something's confusing and unknown, you study it and you're afraid and you're unsure and you're trying to piece it together. And once you have a name, it kind of like goes dormant and you kind of think you know enough about it. And she, as a person named unfit, branded, mm -hmm. like scar on her abdomen, she'd see every day. Mm -hmm. She gets that idea. And, and I had been talking to her about the fish idea, which again, 
is the title of the book, this concept that fish is not a scientifically sound category of creatures and makes people roll their eyes and, and like think that I'm that this is really annoying, but it's actually a simple idea that scientists largely agree on. Um, but she she really got it. And she just was like, oh yeah, there's a there's a danger that when you you slap a group on a kind a name on a kind of thing, um, you believe you know, you know, you you lose your curiosity about what's underneath it and and you think you have a sense of mastery. And I just yeah, that 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 her saying that like really wowed me. It, it, it felt like she was, I don't know, like she had this intimate knowledge, you know, just being trapped under the name. And, and so she just, she got the metaphor of the scientific concept that most people I talk to don't understand. That took me three years mm. of like bad scribbling to understand. Mm. And she just got it. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. And for, you know, maybe folks that haven't made their way to page 174 where it's revealed why fish don't exist um approximation there but um <laughs> no i you you do you kind of you let you get to it like okay let me let me tell you this way okay let me tell you this way and it was amazing how kind of difficult it was for me to wrap my mind around until um so why fish don't exist um has to do with how fish um are the variation in fish or kind of the differences and the similarities within fish so um the the kind of the metaphor that you give which was so really helpful, like, is if we had, if you called every, like everyone that lived on a mountain and you, um, you, you called them all the same thing because of where they lived on the mountain, basically. I'm saying this wrong, but. No, you're kidding. No, the, I'm just, I'm, I'm just relaxing because usually I have to answer this and <laughs> this is the first time a moderator has done it and it, you're doing great and I like it going this way. Keep going. We're Keep saving going. your voice as folks may have noticed. Um, Lulu's voice is a little hoarse tonight. So we're, we're trying to keep her from having to talk a little too much, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, so, uh, so you've got your mountain goats, you've got your, your bearded mountain men and you've got your, you know, your, your eagles or whatever lives up there. And to kind of adapt to that kind of environment, let's say they all put on, uh, they all kind of adapt like plaid covering, let's just say, like Lulu's beautiful scaled pantsuit. <laughs> Um, but it would be it would be false to say like that all of those there's so many differences within like a mountain bearded mountain man, a mountain goat, and an eagle. You wouldn't say those are all mish, which is the name that you put on it. Um, and that kind of helped me again to everyone listening, Lulu does it much better in the book. Um, so read the book and you will know it what, what I'm trying to talk about. But basically, that is why fish don't exist, because as a category, um, there's so much difference about the lungfish, like where sharks, lungfish, salmon, they're they're all their bodies are constructed, I guess that's the wrong one, but like laid out in these different ways that don't have as much in common as you would think. Um, I guess I'm wondering, is there like an alternate category? Like what's the word we're supposed to use instead? That's a great, yeah. Okay, so I think I would love for scientists to like go to their branding department and work, yeah. on, work on this, but yes, of course. So that's the thing. Okay, fine. Okay, fine, Lulu, lady, if fish don't exist, what the heck is down there? And what's down there is more nuanced. What's down there are creatures that look very similar, like just, they look fishy. They look like fishy, scaly, slimy, fishy fish. Mm -hmm. And they're called, Sarcopteregi. Mm. And then there's also Actinopteregi, which also look like fishy fish, but are further from us. So Sarcopteregi are things like lungfish, which actually have a kind of lung in them and a thing called an epiglottis, which is in the throat and are, are, are more closely related to us and to cows than to each other, than to other fishy fish. Then there's also Chrondictites, which are like sharks and rays, which kind of seem closer to us, but are evolutionarily for the, you know, like it came long before. Then there's Mixini, which includes a kind of lampreys and eel-like basis of life. And then you get down to the tunicates, which are not traditionally considered vertebrates, but kind of are these like little sea squirt things that pioneered the first little like pseudo backbone, like made of cartilage, the first attempt um, at, at, at living life with, a, with, with basically your strength on the inside as opposed to a shell on the outside. I don't know. Uh, but but so David Starr Jordan thinks are like these backsliding lazy yeah. moochers. So. Exactly. You read it carefully, Carol. Oh. This is amazing. <laughs> I love it. But uh, so those are the names. So there are different, you know, if you want to talk about um, basically categories of creatures that are that are in the water, mm -hmm. and some of those are closer to us and some of those are farther and they have similarities with each other and they're all the descendants of one ancestor. That's what it means to talk about an evolutionarily significant group of creature because you're talking about evolutionary closeness and relationships. Um, those are the current names. 
but I think like we could talk, you know, we could we could rename the the sar the sarcopter regii like the merf like they're kind of like mermaidy. They've got lungs and scales, you know. You call the the fishy fish the like sail rafe. I mean, you could we got to work on the names, but there are yeah. names. There are groups. Yes. Yeah, got it. Yeah, I just feel like fish is. I just don't see it going out anytime soon, even it's though not. that it's, makes sense. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. but, um, Oh, I will say, yeah. I will say PETA, mm -hmm. um, who does some great work and so, you know, they are controversial people, but they, um, they call fish sea kittens, which I actually think is really cute. Um, but again, that idea they're, they're using it intentionally yeah. to remind you of the potential, cognitive um, complexity and the potential for sentience. And like, mm -hmm. I, I actually kind of think that's kind of a brilliant name. Um, but again, probably going to get eye rolls from a lot of people. But I think well, that's I mean, good. you wouldn't think of like a shark as a kitten necessarily. Although when you <laughs> get like big cats, big that's cats big, I don't know. That's the sea kittens is PETA's term. Maybe okay. we start from there and workshop it. Yeah, yeah. Land yeah, because I mean, it's I think it's a good point. Like again, with the language as a whole, topic within the many things that are part of your book, which we've only talked about a fraction of them, but you know that um, what we do with language matters and it has an actual impact on how we treat things in the world and humans obsession with being at the top and all of these, all of these really compelling issues, important media issues. Um, but yeah, I mean, maybe it's just like water dwelling animals or, you yeah. know, something like it's like water dwelling vertebrates. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Someone else was like, you should call them, um, they were like, imagine a word like fish, but with a pH, phony fish, fish. And then they were like, too bad, that's already taken. Um, but I thought that was good too. But yeah, I mean, that's what they are. Like, if, So if you want to keep all fish, you fish together, all those technical terms I just talked about. If you want to keep them all together, you can. You just need to include us, mm. birds, cows. Mm. So you could also just call them vertebrates. Right. And your calling vertebrates works. My mom is also a fish, which is anyway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, so let's. Um, I've asked about three of the questions that I had, and we will now move. I have many more, but we will now move to audience questions. So, um, thank you everyone for your questions. You can ask them in the ask a question tab. We are going to keep it a little shorter tonight again, just because to spare Lulu's wonderful voice. Um, <laughs> and your gods descended last night and i appreciate it. sorry for the short appreciate you being here we almost had to you know we were on the fence this morning so thank you for for yes. and i'll here. keep my okay i'll keep i'll work on my short answers for you beautiful no this is great and yeah okay so um i'll just start start at the top here um you all can upvote questions that you see that you like um so christian is asking what's the greatest fish related mishap fish hap that you encountered oh love Christian that you encountered while writing the book. I remember reading about how fish were burnt in fires, shaken by earthquakes and confused or misclassified for multiple species. Were there other weird fish tales, another pun you encountered that you couldn't include? Oh, great question. Yes. Well, this is a, I love that question. Um, this is sort of a, a like a little drive by moment in there, but they, um, so on their early expeditions, they, they, they pioneered this practice or not, I don't know. I think other people were doing it. So not pioneered, but they, they loved this practice of dropping dynamite into coral reefs. And, and then, you know, like all the fish would just magically float up, like kind Can of bobbing for that, Please like, oh my and, God. <sighs> and yeah, and here's this person who loves fish and he, and again, it's just like, and he's not, I mean, he, he is a mess of a human, but like, I don't, I don't want to overly villainize it because think about what short sighted things we're doing. Like he just didn't, he didn't really, he thought the good of the study and learning the creatures mm -hmm. and finding them outweighed the damage. Whereas like it is those kinds of practices and the normalizing of them. So anyway, the dynamite into the water frequently um, was a, was a big mishap. Amazing. Okay, so um, okay, wait. I gotta share one more. It's not a fish. Really quick, yeah, octopus. Yeah. I know octopuses are really in, and they're not fish. They're mollusks. They are technically basically like underwater bugs, but they're really <laughs> good at escaping things. And I just heard recently about a little baby octopus that was inside a locked cigar box, and it got out like because it doesn't have bones. It's liquid, and it like picked the lock and got out. 
So there we go. Inside a locked cigar box. Yeah, and it like who do you need its way out? Incredible. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Okay. Okay. Wow. Thank you for sliding that in. And that yeah. also gives us the opportunity to remember the differentiation between water dwelling vertebrates and water dwelling invertebrates. In yes. Thank you. Learning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got a question from Christy who talks about, she she asks, at the end of the book, you mentioned Julia Cameron's Artist's Way. Um, I will pop a link to that into the chat um, so people can find it at Bookshop's website. Would you be willing to share your experience of how it changed your life? It changed mine too. Oh, says. I love that. I'm looking down here to see if she's nearby. She's she's always, she might be on a just out of reach. Um, yeah, so I'll just for context in the in the paperback version. So a lot of the book. Oh yeah, you have it right there. Yes. Okay. So a lot of the um, you know, a lot of the ending of the book, I kind of like ramp myself up onto this borderline tirade about like the beauty of doubt and um, approaching the world with doubt and blah blah blah. And one thing that came up after I wrote it is like, okay, I like that, but like, how do you do that? How do you actually do that? So in the paperback, I included what I'm calling a treasure map of exercises you can do to glimpse the world beyond categories to see a more expansive world. So it's like a treasure map. And these things are, some are drawing, some are writing, some are like out in the world. And one of them is based on an exercise by Julia Cameron. Um, and, and so this book, The Artist's Way, if there's anyone in the house who has not read it, it's it's really great. And she just kind of helps you like recenter with the, passions in your life that you maybe have like put to the side or, or gotten really down on yourself, have low self-confidence about, don't have time for, don't have confidence for. And then in a very playful and passionate way, she like takes you through this, whatever, I actually forget how many weeks it is, but wow. program where you go on dates with your artist self and you do things. Um, and and, and the, the exercise I include involves fire and kind of like burning up some bad limitations on mm -hmm. yourself and she's a big fan of playing matches and fire so that that was inspired by her and i wanted to give her credit um the way that she really um you know i think honestly it's not that i when i did it i did it in my early 20s and it wasn't that it like unlocked the next creative project for me but i kind of think it taught me a deeper lesson which was yeah to like the artist date was very powerful. And the idea of taking your artist self out on a date as though it was a little kid who you needed to entertain and you were the grown up for an hour each week. And it like reminded me to notice what I enjoy. Hmm. Simple as that, like not what's in, not what do you think you should do for one hour a week, like what do you wanna go do? And a lot of that for me involved being out in the world, possibly with a picnic, like in nature, near nature, water, looking, drawing, like it just, it kind of like recentered me to a few very simple things to notice how I want to spend my time and to allow myself like a sacred sandbox hour to enjoy it. And like, I think that has been a gift of like, for all the ways in which we can all struggle with ourselves and what we don't like about ourselves or to at least remember that like, we know how to enjoy an hour of time on earth. <laughs> Um, and that's not just like detaching TV, which Lord, I love TV, but, uh, that there are ways of cutting into this world. And, and that has been a lifelong gift of like a thing I can return to. And yeah, so that's been, it's a, it's a, it's a very powerful book. Beautiful. Thanks for talking about that. I know the treasure map is, is, has some really great kind of questions and, and exercises and ways to kind of drop in a level and kind of get out of the head and more into the experiential, which I really appreciate it. So um, yeah, great question. Especially during COVID, by the way, when we, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like COVID friendly, I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. dandelions, yes. Um, so we have a question from Esther here, and I guess I kind of dove in at the deep end without taking people through you know, how we got started here, which is um, how you got interested in this subject, the subject of David Jordan's, of David Star Jordan. And um, do you want to kind of touch on that a little bit? I apologize to the audience for for leaving that part out. <laughs> oh, no. I mean, the book is weird. I mean, it's about like, it's a weird book. But at the end of the day, we're talking the big ideas. Like, I do hope it's just kind of an adventure story about mm -hmm. a person with a yeah. little bit of my own baggage tossed in there for fun. Um, <laughs> but it was so, I mean, it was truly accidental. It was one of those heard an anecdote 
on a tour of a science museum, the California Academy of Sciences. I heard an anecdote about how he responded after the earthquake um, in this motion of tying the labels to the fish after their names were separated. So 30 years of his work was undone in one second. Um, all this furious labeling and ordering, all the fish were separated from their names. And instead of giving up and like taking the hint that maybe in a world ruled by chaos, the quest of mission is inherently doomed, which I would do. I would just be like, gotcha universe, I'll stop trying. He just like dusted off the water and and just started this violent, like it almost felt like when Peter Pan tries to sew his um, shadow back on with soap or something, like it was like he just sewed the name on. And he was like, you will not get away from me knowledge. And that felt like such a primal mythic gesture of like what we as humans are always trying to do, make the world known despite all its attempts to be more numinous than what we can understand or more complex, use the word you want. And so like, that just spoke to me on a like writerly essayistic visual level. I pictured this little man against all chaos, like with a sewing needle, like I got you. Um, and so I wanted to write truly one page poetic essay, like man versus chaos, and I wanted my friend Kate, who then illustrated the book, to like draw that picture and then just wanted to find out what happened to him and be done. And I wondered, I guess, in sort of a parable sense of like, did this get him ahead? Does this work? Or did he end up the fool, like where I've been trained to kind of think that such hubris would, would do you in? Mm -hmm. um, and that's where it started from. Like, it was just almost a fun little writing exercise. And mm -hmm. then the classic, like, and then I started looking and it led me places way far away from my own framing for him and mm -hmm. answered some questions and it raised more questions. And mm -hmm. 10 years later, <laughs> here we are. 10 years later on book tour for the paperback. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. And um, I want to mention too, if, you know, in terms of your quote unquote baggage, which is called being human, uh, <laughs> but, you know, you're, you did have a, a, an experience as well with your father who, um, you know, when you were, I think you were seven, if I recall in the book, where you kind of turned to him and asked, you know, dad, like, what's the meaning of life? And he excitedly was waiting for you to ask this question and told yeah. you, you know, nothing, the point is nothing. And um, so that, you know, um, seems to me, it seems to have really led to um, kind of wrestling with do things matter don't they matter is it chaos is there order you know what i mean like this kind of back and forth and and then into things like traits like confidence or you know like feeling bad about yourself or feeling great about yourself like kind of like this seesaw of of um that, that kind of you were looking for meaning within you know jordan's search for totally meaning. was i was doing the bad thing yeah i was like <laughs> I was trying to read his life like a parable about mm -hmm. how to be, which you like, you should never do. I mean, that's like a failing of rhetoric anyway to look at one human life for generalized moral instruction when there isn't even like moral instruction that fits any. So it was like it was a foolhardy mission on every level. And yet mm -hmm. sometimes when you're really lost, I was at a lost moment in my life when I started writing it, like sometimes simply having a target to your obsession and your questions. Mm -hmm and like channeling that somewhere into archival research, which eventually turned into like reporting with people who are alive. I mean, that alone sometimes gives you a magnet forward. And so yeah. that's how I ended up here. But like, did I think I was gonna spend this much of my life talking about this random old dead white man? <laughs> no, but it just happened. <laughs> yeah, well, there's so much. I mean, we didn't. We haven't even talked about the poisoning and the strychnine and everything. So yeah. you know, there's so much there. Um, there's lots of intrigue, potential yeah. murder mystery, absolutely yes. heartbreak. There's stuff yes. in there. <laughs> there's stuff in there, and there's entropy, as Carol has mentioned in the in the chat. Which you know, I know. Anyway, I have a, someone close to me that is a huge fan of entropy. It's how he views, you know, the world. Well, he's not a fan of it, but he accepts it as the kind of ruling. Oh, you know, um, so there's just a lot of ideas to to explore. Um, so yeah, it's great. Yeah, entropy is a big character in the book. It's like yeah. David Star Jordan, me, and Entropy <laughs> walk into a book, <laughs> and I don't know. Uh, the yeah. illustrator makes it less more powerful. Yes, the <laughs> illustrations are treasures, absolute treasures. Um, okay, moving. Continuing on with the audience questions. Thank you so much, audience. Um, we have a question from Don, which I think this is a great question. Don asks, 
what way do you think would be best for Jordan's scientific and eugenic past to be explored in schools? Anything I wanted to know, I had to learn myself. The school didn't cover it. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think, I, I just think um, contextualizing, I mean, I think he's actually, obviously, but I think he's a really interesting person to study because in his childhood, there's so much that seemed right. There's so much that set him up, like his beliefs of being wary of, of beliefs and this mm -hmm. idea of trust nature, not books. And, mm -hmm. you know, he, he had so many great teachings and, and things that you think would, would sort of set a person on the right path. Um, and then, and then he went wrong and trying to figure out where and where did he dug, dig in and why I, I think like, I do think, um, I mean, I'm, I'm a, obviously a, I'm a big fan of primary sources. So I think even throwing in a few pages of his, eugenics writing and comparing them to some of his beautiful nature writing in his autobiography, like about his childhood. I think putting those, that could be a fun lesson. Like how did someone who writes this page get to someone who writes this page? And um, yeah, I think that I'm trying to think of like, you know, other places you can go. The thing is he, he wrote so much. Um, mm -hmm. And so that makes him kind of an almost daunting wealth of, of, of sources you can study. But I think, teaching him, especially if you're in California and he has this legacy of mountaintops and schools being named after him, many of which are starting to be renamed, which is cool. Mm -hmm. Or or I don't know, I'm in a certain way I'm agnostic. Like you could keep it named that and have a big plaque to recontextualize it. I think, but I just I think however you do it, I mean there's even one audio recording of him. There's photos. You could yeah. you could look at his illustrations. You could look at his writings. I think however you do it, um just keep doing it. Like, um, and I think depending on the age, um, but I do think letting him be someone to shine a spotlight on to, to kind of see in some way the arc of like, how did someone with, with these values end up here is a really interesting question. And it's like, it kind of parallels questions about the country. You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't think he started out wanting to, I mean, he prided himself on being an abolitionist. He prided right. himself on being a pacifist. And yet he's in the same breath, like over here, he was a pacifist basically as a means to be a eugenicist. And, and so just asking the questions I think is, is a good way to look at him. Yeah, that's, that's great. And I think that's such a good point. Like with the, with the abolitionist spirit in him, which maybe he didn't dive too far into that about why am I, why do I believe this? Is it just because my big brother believed it or, you know what I mean? But yeah, um, it, it really kind of displays the, the complexity that we can't get away from that I think, you know, personal acts to grind here. I think that we are in this period where everything is so simplified and you're either good or you're bad or like you, you make a mistake and so you're done. Like, it's like, it's not actually how humans are. Like we make, we make mistakes and we do things wrong and we have shitty beliefs that we have to change and lots of unlearning to do and stuff like that. So in a way, like putting those two documents side by side could be educational in more ways than one. It can show, yeah. you know, how someone can offer so much and and that can still have value even if ultimately we're not going to hold them up to to that level of respect that we might otherwise you know yeah yeah and on that simplicity versus complexity i mean i think personally as i you know i got into journalism in this sideways way where i originally wanted to be a fiction writer you know it was like the opposite um but then i've woken up it's 15 years later i hope i've like improved at it a little and learned a little bit about, from amazing people about how to do it well but my what i see myself as doing changed over the course of writing this book and again i literally went into it wanting a simple answer was he good or bad yeah. just being this just believing in yourself this much lead to good or bad yeah. you know that was like i wanted simplicity i wanted the parable For and sure. then i found complexity but at the same time i think like what I saw my job is as a journalist more and more is, is to be wary of story and be wary of the neat narrative and actually like just go out and vividly capture as much complexity as you can and then like show it back. And, and just like that actually the job, I literally used to think the job was finding the story and now I think the job is finding the complexity. And so that I think just examining it and letting us all think about what to make of it. What would a legal scholar make of it? What would a psychologist make of it? You know, like, and getting, convening those conversations. Um, 
Because at the end of the day, my whole axe to grind is like, we none of us, none of us know what we're looking at or talking about. And so at least convening conversations and open spaces to try to make sense of it, I think is like, it's just so valuable for education, for society, like for personal <laughs> growing, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, um, gosh, I mean, there's, I could just keep talking to you all night and I, I so appreciate your generosity and all these amazing answers and in your wonderful, wonderful book. Um, I want to mention to our lovely customers that we have some very special, um, items that Lulu sent along. Um, you gotta bring the shine when you're talking about depression and eugenics. I mean, I don't know if you guys can tell from my camera here, but these are these gorgeous shiny stickers. Um, we have a limited supply, but for those who purchase the book tonight, um, we will definitely include, uh, we've got some beautiful, you will see this from the treasure map at the back. Um, we've got some lovely um, stickers and of course a healthy supply of book plates. If you've already purchased your book, book from Bookshop Santa Cruz, you can grab a book plate from the information desk. If you're purchasing a book tonight, we will include some extra goodies, um, shiny, deep, beautiful stickers and dandelions and what. Um, and I signed all those at this kitchen table. I apologize. Oh I have horrible handwriting. But you it's do what not. You got. It's the real deal. I was looking and I was like, okay, her Sharpie's getting a little, a little Sorry. right around here. <laughs> Entropy. Um, Entropy, having its way Entropy. with my signature. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much for setting up these beautiful book plates and all the other things. Um, Lulu, thanks for, for getting through it with your voice. And oh my gosh. Thank, I have to say thank you for your questions. Like I have done a lot of these and I, I really like you really, you really got in there and I could feel how much you read it. And thank you. It's like, oh it's, a, it's a treat to be asked these kinds of questions. So thank yeah. you. Well, I hope we can do it again. Actually, before we go, um, are you working on another book or, um, yeah. What's okay. Well, I mean, so like radio, I, I, I am, I may or may not have just pitched a children's book or two. So cross your fingers for me, ah. um, but yeah, but yeah. And then, and then radio kind of has my heart at the moment. I'm excited about stuff. Okay. Well, that's yeah. very exciting. We will <laughs> still listening to you on the radio where it's also a treat. And, um, so thank you so much. Thanks to Irena and everyone over there at UCSC, the Humanities Institute. Um, and thanks to everyone for being here and we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks. Bye.